Hi students, today we are going to be looking at financial statement analysis. My name is Carly and I'll be taking you through this week's lecture. Before we can get started, we just need to have a look at our learning objectives. As you will see, there are three short videos for this lecture. So in the first video, we are going to be looking at the objectives of financial statement analysis. Then we're going to look at the limitations of accounting information and we're also going to look at the various approaches to financial statement analysis. In the second video, we are going to calculate and interpret commonly used financial ratios. We are also going to look at the DuPont analysis and the failure prediction models. Also in the second video, we are going to look at the limitations of ratio analysis. You'll see in the third video, we are going to go through the class example together. So why am I teaching you financial statement analysis again? As you should remember, you have done this topic in high school and you have also done this topic in financial accounting years one to three. So what can I teach you this year that you don't already know? So what we find is that students actually know how to calculate the ratios with ease, but what they are not good at is analyzing the ratios. Both SEMA and SICA examiners have said that this section is important and it will definitely be necessary in practice. What they also say is that this topic is frequently tested, but students often perform poorly in this section. Like I said earlier, the ratios are usually fine, but it's the analysis that students struggle with. So our aim of the lecture is to focus on the analysis and to be able to equip you to do a good financial statement analysis. So what should you already know? So a company is exposed to two types of risk, financial risk and business risk. What is financial risk? So financial risk results from a company being financed with interest bearing debt. Fixed interest payments will need to be paid on this interest bearing debt. So when a company has fixed interest payments, it is exposed to a risk of default, which is not faced by a company financed exclusively with equity. So this is financial risk. It is basically the risk of default, the risk that the company will not be able to pay its interest and capital payments. If we look at business risk, what is business risk? Business risk is the risk relating to the operating activities of a company. So business risk relates to the nature of the industry and the company's operations. So those are the two types of risks that financial ratios will address. So if we want to assess the financial risk of a company, what ratios will we perform? We will perform solvency ratios, liquidity ratios, and cash flow ratios. What are solvency ratios? So you should recall that solvency refers to a company's ability to meet its long-term financial commitments. Whereas liquidity, liquidity refers to a firm's ability to pay its short-term obligations. So both solvency and liquidity are important and healthy companies are expected to be both solvent and have adequate liquidity. What is cash flow? So cash flow, is basically the essence of any business. If cash flow is inadequate, a company will not be able to pay its future financial obligations. So most analysts actually consider cash flow as one of the best indicators of financial stability. So if we go back to business risk, how are we going to assess the business risk of a company? We are going to look at the profitability ratios, the asset management ratios, and the market value ratio. So when, what are profitability ratios? So profitability ratios show the company's overall efficiency and performance. Whereas asset management ratios, these ratios show how effectively management is utilizing the company's operating assets. When we look at market ratios, we'll see that these ratios indicate the relationship of a company's share price to its dividends and its earnings. So market ratios actually indicate what investors think of the past performance and future performance of a company. So under each of these headings, you have learned ratios in the past, and we will revise those ratios. However, this is not the analysis. They are merely the tools of the analysis. And as I have emphasized, 
Students usually perform the ratios with ease, but it is the analysis part that they fall down on. So the focus of today's lecture will actually be on the analysis. So what is the objective of financial statement analysis? So if we think about our financial statements, what do they comprise? They comprise the statement of financial position. So when we look at this statement, we are analyzing or assessing the financial position of a company. The other statements will show the return of a company. Why will shareholders want to know the return of a company? They will want to ensure that the returns are adequate because they are exposed to a level of risk. So that is the textbook definition of the objective of financial statement analysis. But we can also think about it in a different way. So financial statements are actually a lot like bikinis. If you think about going to the beach and wearing your bikini costume or speedo, what you'll see is that the bikini, what it reveals is very interesting, but what it hides is vital. And in the same way, financial statements are just like bikinis. If you look at the financial statements, what they reveal on the surface is very interesting. But what the set of financial statements is hiding is vital. And we are going to want to reveal this vital information. And the way we are going to do that is by performing ratios and then analyzing those ratios. So I highly recommend you watch this little video here. So who performs financial statement analysis? There are various users of financial statement analysis. So if we look at shareholders and investors, Shareholders are suppliers of the firm's equity risk capital. Usually, this risk capital receives dividends after interest on debt has been settled. So what are shareholders interested in? Shareholders are interested in all aspects and stages of operations, profitability, liquidity, capital structure, and the general valuation of a company. We also have credit grantors. So credit grantors can be split into those that provide short-term credit and those that provide long-term credit. Trade creditors who supply goods or provide services on credit normally provide short-term credit, whereas banks and financial institutions usually provide long-term credit. So both long-term and short-term credit grantors will be concerned with the firm's capital structure and the level of financial leverage which will determine the level of financial risk of the company. Then we have management and employees. So management would want to perform financial statement and analysis as they will want to view the firm in the way that outsiders, such as creditors and investors, see the firm. So remember, manager's objective is to maximize shareholder wealth and they would want to assess how do shareholders view the firm. So they will also be interested in performing financial statement analysis. Then we have employees. So employees will be interested in the long-term viability of a company since they will want to ensure that they have job security in the future. Then we have customers and suppliers. So if a customer is going to buy a car or an asset from a company, they will want to ensure that the company is going to be around long enough to meet any warranty provisions and also to supply any spare parts that the customer would need. Suppliers would want to ensure that the company is able to pay for any goods and services that it supplies. Acquisition and merger analysts. So the analysis of financial statements will help the merger and acquisition analyst as they will need to know what the economic value of the firm is going to be. So when they analyze the financial statements, this will help them to determine what the economic value of the company will be and also to assess any potential synergistic benefits. So auditors, auditors would undertake financial statement analysis at the beginning of an audit and will assess where the risks lie and where the focus of the audit work will be. Then we have government. So here we can think of SARS. So SARS would analyze the financial statements and they would check the reasonability of income tax returns and payment of indirect taxes such as VAT. So the next section we are going to look at is the limitations of financial data. So the accounting data on which we perform the analysis on has certain limitations that we need to consider. 
The first limitation is monetary expression. So the accounting data contains information that is expressed in terms of monetary value. So where we have any attributes that cannot be expressed in terms of RAND value, these would tend to be ignored. And an example I can give you of this is if you were to ask any company what are its biggest assets, some of the companies would say that its employees and staff are among its biggest assets. However, you will never see employees and staff capitalized and treated as an asset in the statement of financial position because it obviously doesn't meet the asset definition. So even though a company will consider its employees and staff to be an asset, this cannot be quantified and it cannot be expressed in a monetary value or term. Therefore, this would be ignored in the financial statements. The next limitation is simplification and summarization. So if you think about your set of financial statements, it is made up of a whole lot of transactions and account balances. These transactions and account balances are grouped together to form the line items in the financial statements. Therefore, this will often result in the loss of clarity and detail. If you think about your provisions, when you look at your provisions in your statement of financial position, you won't be able to see the transactions making up those provisions. So it is a very summarized statement or the data is very summarized, which makes you lose a certain amount of understanding and clarity. The next limitation is flexible accounting policies. So a proportion of the financial data contained in the financial statements is based on subjectivity and flexible criteria rather than objective criteria. So where does the subjectivity arise from? The subjectivity arises from the estimation and judgments of the accountants who prepare the financial statements and in the accounting policies applied. An example of this would be the depreciation policy. So depreciation policies and estimates of expected useful lives will affect the asset balance at year end in the financial statements. This can differ. So two companies can each have the same asset, but their depreciation policy could be different. And this is subjective, and this is obviously going to have an impact on the financial data and the asset balances and depreciation shown in the financial data. The last limitation of financial data we are going to consider is inflation. So inflation leads to a decline in the purchasing power, and this reduces the standard of value of the currency. So these changes are not necessarily reflected in the accounting data. So an example of this would be when measuring returns, you must be careful when comparing current returns with assets purchased 20 years ago. The next section we're going to look at are the various approaches to financial statement analysis. So you'll see here we have it broken down into three different approaches. We can have horizontal analysis, we can have vertical analysis, and we can have ratio analysis. So what is horizontal analysis? I have an example on the next slide to show you. So an in index analysis, this is an example of a horizontal analysis. So in an index analysis, as you will see here in the example, a base year is chosen. And in that base year, all values are expressed as 100%. Years following the base year will be expressed in terms of the percentages calculated on the base year. So as you can see in our example, 2001 is the base year. So all items or all items in the financial statements are shown at 100% in the base year. Every year after that, like 2002, each line item is expressed as a percentage on the base year. So if you look at property, plant and equipment, in the base year it is 100%. In 2002 it is 108%. So what we can deduce from this is that the balance of your PPE in 2002 is 8% higher than in 2001. So index analysis actually allows quite a quick and easy comparison of years. So if you go to the next slide, this is an example of index analysis in your statement of comprehensive income. So as consistent with the previous slide, 2001 is the base year. So each line item is 100%. Then in 2002, each line item is expressed as a percentage of your base year. So if we look at sales revenue, in 2002 it is 154% in relation to the base year. 
So it is quite easy to deduce that sales revenue has increased by 54% in 2002. The next slide is going to look at vertical analysis. So an example of vertical analysis is common size analysis. So what is common size analysis? So common size analysis is used to show individual items as a proportion of the total group. So in, in a common size statement of comprehensive income, sales revenue is expressed as 100% and every other item is expressed as a percentage of sales revenue. So you can see here that sales revenue is expressed as 100%. Every other line item is expressed as a percentage of sales revenue. If we go to the next slide, which shows the common size statement of financial position, in here, each item is expressed as a percentage of total assets. So you'll see the total assets is expressed as 100%. Every other line item in your statement of financial position is expressed as a percentage of your total assets. The next type of analysis is ratio analysis. You should all be familiar with how to calculate the ratios, but we are going to revise the ratios in the next video. 